Thank you so much for those powerful words and for singing that together. We are gathered here on this Easter Sabbath. It's a special day in the Christian calendar, a significant weekend where yesterday we commemorated Good Friday, Christ's crucifixion. Tomorrow is the empty tomb. Today, we remember what the Apostle Paul describes as the core and ground of our faith in Corinthians 15, where he writes to each one of us these words that we remember. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received in which you also stand, through which you are being saved. If you hold firmly to the message that I proclaimed to you, unless you have become to believe it in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with with scripture. I remember growing up with these Easter celebrations. These words at the very heart of our faith took on a new significance for me when a few years ago, as I mentioned, I had the incredible privilege of visiting Jerusalem and walking along the streets where Jesus walked, in particular, on this final week of his life. I remember standing, overlooking Jerusalem, where some think that Jesus was on Palm Sunday, on the Sunday before his crucifixion. I remember wandering the streets, going to the place where they think that Pontius Pilate proclaimed Jesus' death sentence. I remember going to a particular spot where tradition believes that Jesus was actually crucified and you can see a crack in a rock that, that some think is when the earthquakes happened this weekend of his crucifixion. And it was an incredible experience to be there. But there were two places in particular that really stood out to me perhaps unusual ones, maybe because of the crowds and the, the busyness that Jerusalem experiences right now, these two places were somewhat more quiet and they were places where I was able to experience or have some time to reflect on Jesus' life in a little bit of a different way. And they both were gardens. Two gardens that I want to share with us as we consider this Easter story this morning. The first is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's on a hill on the other side of a small valley. And you can kind of see Jerusalem there and there's olive trees all around. And I remember sitting there and it was quiet and there weren't that many people around. And there were these olive trees that were thousands of years old right next to me. Wondering about that night at the Garden of Gethsemane. A night of deep anguish and suffering. I've been thinking about this past year. A year that has been full of anguish and suffering. I don't know about you, but it has been hard to watch the news lately. Not just, not just pandemic news of this past year, but in so many ways, the work, brokenness of the world seems so very apparent. Easter, sometimes we are tempted to rush through the parts to get to the resurrection, but today we're gonna to pause in our race to the resurrection and sit a while with Jesus on this Thursday night before the crucifixion, death, and resurrection. Before Jesus goes to Gethsemane, 
he is celebrating Passover with his disciples. And I invite you to enter into this story with me from Mark's Gospel, Mark 14. If you have your Bibles with you or if you have it on your phones, turn with me to Mark 14, verse 12. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat? So he sent two of disciples telling them, go into the city and the man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs finished and ready. Make preparations for us there. Verse 16, the disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This moment that Jesus shares with his disciples is a moment that we are going to commemorate and remember later in our service. It's a foreshadowing moment where Jesus says, take, eat, drink, remember what is about to happen, what I am going to do for you. Jesus is letting his disciples know that the following day he is going to break his body and pour out his blood, but this sacrifice will not be in vain. It will be for us and it will have a power far beyond what any of us can imagine. The disciples don't know that yet, however. So Jesus leads his disciples from this supper down the valley up into the mountain or the hill on the other side. And Jesus knows that what is going to come is going to be so hard for him. He warns his disciples that it may overwhelm them to the point of despair. A little later in the story, he says, You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But as is our nature, the disciples say, No, Jesus. Peter insists emphatically, even if I had to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And with that promise, they arrive at the place called Gethsemane. And Jesus asks his disciples to sit for a while as he prays. And then he takes three, three who he's been close with, Peter, James, and John, a little with him, uh, with him a little further up. And in this dark garden, the night before his crucifixion, Jesus becomes deeply distressed, or some translations say struck with anguish or terror. He lets his closest friends know that he is feeling overwhelmed and asks them to pray for him. And Jesus then falls to the ground and prays. He feels the weight of the world. Sometimes this year has felt so heavy, hasn't it? The weight of the brokenness of this year has felt overwhelming. The pandemics 
of not just illness, but the pandemics of hatred and distrust of each other, of racism and shootings and brokenness and sin. Heavy. Jesus falls to the ground and prays, please, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup from me. It is heavy. We have cried that prayer. And then Jesus says, yet not what I will, but what you will. One of our pioneers in the Adventist church, a an incredible woman of God by the name of Ellen White writes about this moment in a book called Desire of Ages. And she shares, she invites us to to imagine together just how Jesus must have felt in that moment, especially about the friends he was depending on. She writes, the human heart longs for sympathy and suffering. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those he had so often blessed and comforted and had shielded in sorrow and distress. The one who had always had words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony, and he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. If he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened, rising with painful effort. He staggered to the place where he had left his companions, but he found them asleep. We don't know how long Jesus lies there on the ground, overwhelming and pleading and heart sore, feeling the pain. To a magnitude we can't imagine, but that we might have had a taste of this past year. What we do know is that when Jesus eventually returns to his disciples, he finds them asleep, oblivious to his pain. Three times Jesus goes away to pray, heart aching, overwhelmed. Three times he returns to find his friends asleep, Ellen White continues saying, three times he uttered that prayer, three times humanity shrunk from the last crowning sacrifice. But now the history of the human race came up before the world's redeemer. He sees the transgressions of the law, if left to themselves, will perish. He sees the helplessness of each one of us. He sees the power of sin. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise before him. He beholds its fate and his decision is made. He will save humanity at any cost. He has left the courts of heaven where all is purity, happiness, and glory to save the one lost sheep. The one world that has fallen by transgression, he will not turn from this mission. He will save us. So the hour comes and Jesus' betrayer arrives there in the garden of Gethsemane. And once again, Jesus' disciples see that he is really actually going to allow himself to be arrested. And once they see this, despite all their brave talk just a little bit before, Scripture says they desert him and flee. These are painful words to see Jesus' friends deserting him and fleeing. And yet we can't be too quick to judge. Very few people choose to stick around for suffering. It's not a joke. It's not pleasant or glorious or glamorous. It is hard to endure. It is hard to be around. We don't want to suffer. And despite all that Jesus had said to prepare this for this, them for this time, they weren't really prepared for what this suffering would mean. The suffering of Jesus seemed bad news to them. Perhaps they wondered why Jesus was suffering. And I think 
We have two answers we see here in Scripture to that question. The first is a simple one. There is a clear human reason for the suffering of Jesus. Jesus loved well and loved people he wasn't supposed to love. And the enemies of Jesus did not like that. Because Jesus' love wasn't safe or predictable or sanctioned, Jesus was hated for those who he loved. The people on the margins, the people who everybody else was rejecting, the people who felt themselves to be beyond hope. Those are the people that Jesus said, I have come for them. And his enemies did not like it. If his words hadn't had power, no one really would have hated him. But his words had the power to change everything. And the people and powers who invested in the way things were didn't want it to happen. So humans killed him. But on the other hand, scriptures suggest a divine reason for suffering. That on the cross, what was exposed was not just the sin of people at that moment. But what was exposed was our human sin. Each one of us. The sins that each one of us have committed. See over and over again in the Old Testament, scriptures that say that God, God's heart breaks because of the iniquity, the brokenness, the sinfulness of this world. In Jeremiah 25, it tells us, Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. There is a cup of wrath for sinfulness and a broken body of love for the sinners. We see on the cross the true picture of what sin leads us to. And we also see on the cross the true expression of the depths to which God is willing to go for us. I've mentioned this before in our past series, that sometimes suffering can make us question the character of God. Is God out to get us because the world doesn't seem like a safe place? And sometimes you can look at the story of Jesus in the garden, look at Jesus' suffering and his plea, and, and you can wonder in these quiet moments of suffering about what God the Father is really like. Why is Jesus suffering so much? Does God not care? Throughout the whole past series, when we were looking at the Gospel of John, I think it's really important to note what John is saying about Jesus for this moment. There is no other picture of God other than what is revealed through Jesus. Sometimes we think of the Old Testament God as an angry God, just waiting for, something, for us to do something so he can punish us. But as we saw throughout the Gospel of John, if you have seen Jesus, you have seen God. The language of the Son is supposed to emphasize that on the cross we see God's love for us displayed. We see this in the another prayer that is recorded on this evening. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke record Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane with his heart breaking. The Gospel of John records another prayer that night that we looked at earlier. The prayer that's not about the distance of God, but God's closeness. In John 17, Jesus prays that the disciples, those followers of Christ, may become one as we are one, he says to his father, I and them and you and me, that they may become completely well one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So as we enter into communion, let us remember that Jesus shows us who God is and the depths to which God is willing to go for us. This year has been a difficult one. 
And there have been times, as I've said, when we're facing the deep challenges and we see the evidence of sin all around us. It can feel so heavy. We can cry out to God. God, this is so heavy. Over even just the past few weeks, there have been shootings and kidnappings and hatred and death. And lest we as Christians are too quick to point the finger, we also see evidence of sin within the church, evidence of Christians being unloving, evidence of Christians causing harm, evidence of Christians being deeply broken. And lest we say that, well, at least we're not like those people, if you were honest, isn't there evidence of our own brokenness and our own sinfulness? When I was younger, in my late teens and early 20s, I didn't always like this language of our sinfulness or brokenness. I figured out to myself that, you know, I had not done any of the really big sins, hadn't killed anybody. I hadn't, you know, committed adultery or I hadn't done any of those ones that were on the Ten Commandments, more or less. But as I've grown in age and just a little bit of wisdom, I have recognized how far all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and how deeply I need forgiveness and grace. I need forgiveness and grace from God. I need forgiveness and grace from those around me my best efforts still need to depend on the grace of God. And that is the same for each of you listening. Each one of us, our best efforts are dependent on the grace of God to come first. It is God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's unconditional love that can transform us and change our hearts. In this first story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus heartbroken and distressed, feeling the full weight and reality of sin and its consequences. But this garden is a, is a middle garden in a bigger story. It reminds us, it points us back to a garden at the very beginning of the Bible, a garden in the Garden of Eden where God created us to be with us. This life that we are living is not part of God's original plan. And even though we betrayed him there, he has a plan to bring us back into relationship with him so that we can be God with us and us with God, so that we can be redeemed and restored, and that there can be healing and wholeness. This garden reminds us of how God started, and it also points us forward to another garden that we're going to see just a couple days from now. On Sunday morning, there is that garden that Mary goes to where she goes to see the body of her Lord and Savior. And yet she finds, she finds that she cannot find the body. And she turns to someone who she thinks is the gardener in this garden and says, who says to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she says, I cannot find my Lord. And says, he's not in the tomb. He's risen. He's there. The second garden I visited in Jerusalem was a garden with a tomb, an empty tomb. A tomb that they say looked very similar to the tomb of Jesus Christ from that time period. And I walked in and I saw where the linens were. 
And I sat in that garden and I imagined, here is the basis of our faith. That that tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. He is risen. He is risen. Our sins are forgiven. And he is here and he will come again soon. These garden stories. Today, we're going to partake in the communion service. And I'm inviting our deacons and elders to come forward as we take part in this together. We practice here open communion, which means that if you have given your heart to Jesus and want to partake in this communion service and visiting from us from another church, you are welcome. We will pass out the emblems, the body and the blood. These symbols of Christ's body and blood. We ask you to hold on to them as you receive them, and we will take part in them together. You can grab the mics here. As we pull out the emblems, we'll be sharing some songs with you that we invite you to listen to the words of these songs. Spend this time in prayer and contemplation with your Savior. Consider the sacrifice that he's given for you and consider this offering of grace and redemption that is yours today. If you will bow your heads with me for our prayer over the emblems. symbolizes your broken body. We are so grateful that Jesus died for us. So with that symbol of bread, we are thanking him forever, eternally, that he broke his body, let his body be broken for us. So bless the emblem now as we take it. We know it's not the literal body, but it's a representation of what he did for us on Calvary's cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Querido Padre Celestial, al recordar el sacrificio de tu Hijo, al tomar el jugo de la vid, queremos pedirte tu bendición sobre él, que lo tomemos con respeto, con reverencia y con agradecimiento. El vino representa la sangre derramada en la cruz del Calvario para perdón de nuestros pecados. Y hoy nosotros reconocemos ser pecadores delante de ti y venir a ti en busca del perdón otorgado por tu Hijo amado. Gracias, Señor, por esta gran bendición. Pon tu bendición en el jugo de la vid para que al ingerirlo nosotros sintamos esa paz que solamente Cristo Jesús puede dar. En su nombre lo pedimos. Amén. Amen.